Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, because you rose from the grave, death does not have victory over your children. And we rejoice in that. Lord, you did not save us and set us free and give us life so that we might just simply live somewhat morally and on our own terms. You gave us life and set us free so that we might walk with you and that we would become more and more like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who came as a servant and died on the cross for our sins. Father, I pray that as we look at your word today, as we observe the Lord's Supper, that we might think deeply and carefully, not only about the claims of the gospel, about what our Lord and Savior has done for us, but this remarkable, completely countercultural life that you've called us to. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good to see you today, and isn't it nice to have something like fall or winter or whatever? We, what do we call this here now? Whatever it is, we can all like it. Can we agree? Is it okay? I don't want to hear any complaining about cold. If you're already complaining about cold, please remember the past 38 months or however long it was, <laughs> right? Seriously, that was getting a little bit old. So I praise God when I walk out this morning. I was like, yes which we should do every day, right? Not just circumstantially, but I was exceptionally yes today. So um, puts a bounce in your step. I don't know about you, but I, I kind of, I like this time of year. Awesome. We're looking at a message today, um, a text rather, and it, if you're paying attention, is going to assault your sensibilities. It assaults mine. This is a countercultural message. And here's the thing, is that all messages should be countercultural because we who belong to Christ are not called to go with the, the flow of the stream of our culture, but whether we are called to be transformed from the inside out to be a countercultural people. And my concern is, is that in the American church for far too long, we've forgotten we were called to far, far more than mere religiosity. We're called to life, transformed, countercultural living that glorifies the living God. That's some deep stuff. And I'm going to tell you what, the times are coming. If you're paying attention, the times are here. When the need is greater than ever for our culture to see a living picture amongst the people of God of who the Lord Jesus is. These times are getting strange and dark. I'm not just talking about <laughs> the, 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 the increasing uh, sense of mob rule being acceptable in our culture. This is a concern. It's a concern when you, when you read, not in some little strange news outlet, but when you read that, that you have a group of witches in New York City in a bookstore gathering to, to cast incantations and curses upon certain political leaders, and you might say, oh, that's just mumbo jumbo, then you do not know the spirit of Jezebel nor the unseen realm and the forces that are out there. We are living in dark, increasingly dark times. And I'm just going to, I'm going to tell you this, you put the armor on, you walk with the Lord Jesus, and you and I will either be the people who follow the Lord Jesus, or we won't. But I'll tell you what, it, it goes back to that, that whole idea, choose this day whom you're going to serve. You and I cannot serve God in culture. We never could anyway. But the, the, but the, the chasm is getting wider and wider. Okay, so trying to live in two worlds is a prescription for disaster. So why don't we, let's just do this. As the people of God, we profess to be the people of God. Let's ask the Lord to give us a consuming passion to be like him and to follow him. No matter what the world says about us, because that ultimately doesn't matter. If your identity is in Christ, they can't take that from you. But if your identity is in success and being seen as important, being seen as whatever, 
that can be stripped away. If your identity is found in the culture embracing you and accepting you, then that can be taken away from you. But guess what? It cannot be taken away. They can take your body, but they can't take your soul. You give yourself fully over to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is one thing they cannot take. That's where life is found. So we're starting off today with some big stuff. I'm going to ask us to please pay attention because this is the life that you and I are called to. And if we're going to be uh, a church that God uses for his glory, this is the life that we corporately are called to. We have been looking in our sermon series about what might make for a great church. And it's been a, a different type of a thing. We have a different definition of greatness. We've seen that we must have a great focus, a consuming vision for the glory of God, that, that, that the glory of God be that which uh, is what we're ultimately concerned with, not our own glory, but, but focusing on God and what the things are that he says are important, not the trivial secondary and tertiary things we tend to get sidetracked on. It's not about us. It's all about him, Right? Point one, point two, if you remember as we've been in this series, we have looked at the importance of beginning with the end in mind. So in other words, running the race well and finishing well should be our prayer, our passion. You're running a race. All of us are. Individually and corporately to run well, to finish well, so that on that day you will stand before your king and hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's what we want to hear, Right? Okay, you still with me? I'm just getting started, okay? I can't lose you now. We've seen that we are called uh, in our walk with Christ to not be distracted by looking upon the past, either with a sense of boasting or of regret. Christ is Lord over the, over, over the past. And so we're called to fix our eyes forward on the King, on Him, forgetting those things that are behind, okay? We're called to give cheerfully and joyfully out of worship and thanksgiving. And that's a part of what it means to be the people of God on mission. You're just going to do that because you want to worship the God and you want to, you want to, to say, Lord, hear, you know, <laughs> that's just worship. It's a part of worship that allows more ministry to take place. And today we're going to see that we're, so, we're called to have a very certain type of disposition, a same heart, a same mindset, all of us. This is where greatness is found. If you want to be great, here's, here's, how you be, here's how you're going to be great, okay? Philippians chapter 2. So if there's any comfort in Christ, any, any, any encouragement in Christ, rather, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. This is what Paul is writing to the church in Philippi. His main concern you see is in verse 2, he is supremely concerned with the unity of the church in Philippi. The Lord cares about the unity of the church in Stonebridge. This is not just something he was concerned about for the Philippians. So the Lord looks at our church and says, Stonebridge, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. That's not a suggestion from our Lord. So in verse 1, when he says, if there is any encouragement, comfort, love, participation in the Spirit, he's not saying if these things do exist. He's really saying because they exist. In other words, because there is encouragement in Christ. This refers to the consolation that we receive through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, you know as his child that he gives consolation. And you praise him for that. If there is any comfort, because there is comfort from love, this refers to the Lord coming close to us and comforting us himself with his love. Now, if you've been born again, if you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, you know that he gives comfort to you, that he loves you. And that's another reason, not for me, but you look at him and go, Lord, thank you. You love me. And sometimes the thing that breaks my heart is how can we talk about the love of God as if I just mentioned something about like, yeah, you know, uh, today so-and-so is playing so-and-so. It's like, yeah, 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 I know that. We're talking about the fact that the King of kings and the Lord of lords, if you're his child, loves you. That's amazing, right? 
and, and how did we how do we get to the point where we we're just not amazed by that anymore? We're just kind of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus loves me. I sing it with a kid. I know. Yeah, whatever. He loves you. He loves you. And because there is participation in the Spirit, here's the deal. All of us as Christians, we have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. The, you, as, you, don't, you don't work to get the Holy Spirit. You are converted and you are given, the Holy Spirit is given to you. He seals you. All of us as his children have the same Lord and the same Spirit. That's amazing. The Spirit of God lives within you if you are His child. Now, if you're not, if you have not given your life to Christ, I'm not trying to be rude, but none of this applies to you. And my heart aches for you, and I plead with you, give your life to Him today. Give your life to Him today. But we have the same Lord, we have the same Spirit. It says that if there is any affection and sympathy, this refers to how God has given us deep affection, compassion, all of his children. We've all received these remarkable graces. And because of this, we have this kind of fellowship with the Lord. And guess what? Here's the radical idea. Because we have the same God, the same Lord, the same Spirit, we should be radically changed and different. Go figure. Christians should be different. It's not that Christians, yeah, it's a good idea if you want to be different. Christians should be different. I don't mean weird. I mean different. We should look more and more like our, our Savior. Not like this world system. Not like this world system. We're to live in the grace that he provides radically different lives. And this is only possible because of the Lord who lives within us. Okay? You and I can't do this, and we don't want to do it in our own strength and our own will. But because the Lord Jesus Christ has saved us, and his spirit lives within us, and because we have a glorious and wonderful Heavenly Father who is continually at work, it is therefore possible to be different. Amen. Complete my joy, Paul says. That's why it's possible. Do these things. In other words, in and through Christ, these things are possible. Paul's joy in the Lord was seeing God at work amongst the people of God. And in this particular case, he wanted to see God glorified by them being unified. You know what the blesses the Lord's heart is when he sees the people of God love one another. It blesses pastors' hearts too. Pastors love it when they're not playing referee, but when they sit back and go, wow, look at God's people, man. That's amazing. And you just sit back sometimes and you're just like, Lord, thank you for letting me see this. That's beautiful. But all too often, the referee thing has to be done. That's tragic. And it's wrong. I'm going to tell you why. Paul says, make my joy complete. Let me see Christ at work in you. Be of the same mind. Literally means thinking the same way. Thinking the same way and being like-minded. Having the same love. You and I are to love one another in Christ with the kind of love that he has shown us. Be in full accord of one mind. Literally means intent on one purpose. That means everyone on the same page under the lordship of Christ, under the authority of God's word, the leadership of the Holy Spirit, pulling and moving in the same direction. One mind. And so, oh, it's impossible. It's impossible if you remove God from the equation, yes. But if you put God back in the equation where he belongs, nothing's impossible. You see it in Scripture, they were of one mind and one accord. And I've seen it in life. I've seen it in churches. Don't you dare look at me and say, well, you know. No, no, no. Because of the Lord, the Lord, yeah, this is a supernatural enterprise. If you remove supernatural, uh, the supernatural part of our faith, you don't have the Christian faith. You've got mere religion. But because we have a Lord who is over all, he is able to do a work in the midst of his people that brings great glory to himself and makes us one and gives us one mind with one purpose. And I'm going to show you one of the keys to that in a second. And this is the where it really gets hard, okay? And this is where we was. I, I, I prefer to be like the culture, if we're honest. 
That's where we struggle. We're, we're going to see how we get that. But another, if this is going to happen, I will say this. God has called us to far more than just to, to, to get along. <laughs> okay? This is a radical call. And I think the sad reality is often we pray too low, we aim too low, and sadly, we settle for far less than what the Lord has for us in terms of his work amongst his people. You're not called to tolerate one another. We're called to love one another. How many of you want to hear someone say, you know what, I just want to say, I, I, I tolerate you. I sure do tolerate you. <laughs> Thanks, right? We're called to love. When the Lord is at work amongst the people and they're coming under the lordship of Christ, under the authority of God's word, and they're praying, and they're allowing the Holy Spirit to do what the Holy Spirit does, and they recognize that we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. We are the redeemed children of God. We share the same God, the same Lord, the same Savior, the same Spirit. It changes everything. Let's not forget that we're not like the world, okay? We're called to far more, far, far more. Because there is encouragement in Christ, because there's comfort from love, participation in the spirit, affection and sympathy, we therefore pursue the life that Christ has in mind for us. We're to have the same mind, the same love, to be in full accord of one mind. Paul now continues into a life, uh, calling us into a life that glorifies God in, in doing these things, what strengthens these bonds. Therefore, how does this flesh itself out? Because you know what happens all too often, and, and, and happens in, <laughs> it happens in church life. And last night, I kind of I called it the Conor McGregor church life effect, you know? You know who Conor McGregor is, even if you don't watch stuff. You know who the, the loud, boastful guy is, and he walks around like this stuff, right? And you get people in churches that'll do that, right? And it's like, oh, I'm coming here, I'm getting my way, and so on and so forth. And when that happens in the life of a church, that is unbelievably toxic and dangerous. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about who's got the stronger personality. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. It's his church. Okay? So, while the culture may swag like Conor McGregor, the church, we're called to something profoundly different. Check it out. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. So, how are you going to have this unity? Well, here's a good way to start. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of, of, man, that's pretty radical. That's not the culture, is it? Particularly that whole part about counting others more significant than yourself. So what's Paul talking about? He's saying this, reject selfishness. Reject selfish ambition. Reject this idea of conceit. Don't do anything from these postures, these positions, because these ultimately stem from the desire to be seen as important, the thought process that says, I'm better, I'm more important than so-and-so. When that comes into the life of a fellowship, it harms. In other words, you don't come in and beat people down, push people down. You and I are here to lift people up. To not look out just for what I want, but to, to care for others. Okay? Pride kills. Pride quenches the Holy Spirit. Pride quenches the activity of God amongst the people of God. The gospel produces humility. You know why? Because the gospel rightly understood, I don't have one thing to brag about. I am dust. I am a worm. I am a vapor. I am absolutely nothing. I am a sinner by nature. I have no hope except for the Lord Jesus Christ. I did not do one scintilla of one thing, nor could I, to save myself, to make myself right with God. I was spiritually dead, yet God in his grace poured out his mercy on me, a sinner. I did not deserve that. So if I'm going to brag about anything, it's Jesus. I got nothing to brag about. Nothing. Nothing. But I do have a great king. And so do you. Let's do this. Let's brag about him. Let's boast in him. You see, the, the gospel produces a humility where you realize, man, I'm not... 
I'm, we're all, I'm, I'm just another beggar like you. I, got, <laughs> I was given bread by the king of kings, the bread of life. I, I didn't do anything to earn it, and so I, I don't have anything inherently over you where I'm like, you know, whatever, right? In humility, consider others more significant than yourself. Simply put, just be humble. That's what humility does. It puts, it, it puts others... <laughs> In a, in a different position. It doesn't put them in the back of the line. Doesn't, you don't climb over people. That's the culture, isn't it? Climb to the top of the ladder. Hurry up and climb, climb, climb. Push people out of the way. Get to the front, man. It's like being in a, at a crowded H-E-B or a crowded Walmart where everybody's jammed in together. That's a metaphor for life sometimes. Everybody trying to get over, to get in front. They're impatient. But the church, we're different. The people of God, we're different. We're not arguing over who's in the front of the line. We're here to serve. We're here to bless. We're here to brag about Jesus and tell what he's done. What he's done. This kind of humility elevates others. It glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ. It blesses others. It shows love to others. It's the same kind of sacrificial, selfless love the Lord has shown us. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also the interest of others. So don't run around just looking for what you want and care about what others need. That's pretty radical. Again, if, you, if, you're, if you're paying attention, look at the culture. Listen to what God's Word says. It's night and day, okay? This is not what the culture says is great, is it? How many of these would you say would be great halftime speeches before an athletic event? Men? I want you to get out there and consider that other team better than you. Motivational speaking at work, right? <laughs> this is the exact opposite of what the culture says, but here's the, here's the, here's the wonderful life-giving secret. You embrace this, you live this way again, and you will have a joy no one can take from you. Your identity is rooted in the right person in the right place. But if you're thinking I've got to be seen as important. I better be seen as important. That's what everybody else is doing. It doesn't know Jesus. Let's not do that. Okay? Some people look at humility and they say, well, I just, I don't know. I, I think that's weakness. I love what Spurgeon had to say. He said, think not that humility is weakness. It shall supply the marrow of strength to thy bones. Stoop and conquer. Bow thyself and become invincible. You and I have a strength that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. So you want to be great in God's eyes. You want to have power. It's not physical power that comes from the flesh, but the power of God resting upon you. Then you humble yourself before God and others. Okay? Humble yourself before God and others. Let God elevate you. Don't try to elevate yourself. Let God be the one who does this. Verse 5, having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. In other words, let me show you how this looks, or what this looks like, rather. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. There is a lot going on here, okay? Time restricts me from going as much as I would like to get into all of this. But I'm going to hit some of the high. First of all, have this mind among yourselves. For all Christians, a shared mindset. Think this way. In other words, think like Jesus. Jesus Christ, who is in the very form of God. Paul is affirming that Jesus is eternally, has been God, and he is God. Fully God, fully human. That's who Jesus is in the incarnation, okay? Fully God, fully man. John MacArthur had a good commentary note here. He said, the grammar stresses the essence of a person's nature, his continuous state or condition. Paul affirms that Jesus has eternally been God. Even though this is and was and who Jesus is, Paul said this, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Simply put, even though Jesus had every right and privilege and honor as God the Son, he willingly chose to not cling to those things, to that position, but to willingly, for a season, set those aside in his incarnation. He emptied himself. That's the doctrine. It's known as the doctrine of kenosis. Christ 
self-emptying in the incarnation. This was a self-renunciation. He didn't empty himself of his deity. He's still, again, fully God, fully human. What Jesus did in his ministry was he set aside certain things. And I'm going to go back to MacArthur. He raised a a few good points. One, he set aside heavenly glory while on earth he gave up the glory of a face-to-face relationship with God the Father that he had had from eternity past. That was different. Two, during the incarnation, Jesus submitted himself to the Father's will and the Spirit's direction. Three, he gave up eternal riches while on earth Jesus was poor and he had so very little. Four, he gave up a favorable relationship with the Father, specifically on the cross. There he endured God's wrath against our sin. Prior to the incarnation, he did not know hunger, fatigue, weariness, or loneliness, but he experienced that and sorrow and much more during his earthly life. Jesus leaves the splendors of heaven, not because he had to, because he owed us, but because this is what he chose to do in love, was to come and to redeem us. And this is the cost of our salvation. God the Son laying his life down on a cross dying the most horrible death so that we could be free, so that we could be reconciled to the Father, so that we could be forgiven, so that our sins, shame, and guilt could be covered. It is that serious. So when the Lord looks at you and I and says, be humble, humble yourself, he's saying, what he's saying is, look, look at me. Look at what I did. Now you do. Be humble. Jesus taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Taking the form of a servant, the Son of Man came to serve, not to be served. He came to give his life as a ransom. This is crucial for our understanding of what it means to be Christians. What it means to live this Christian life, if we just get this point here that we're called to serve. Here's the deal. You want to be great? Jesus says, and I'm borrowing, I forget the, the, the theologian's name, go low. Go low. Go low. Take the form. Be a servant. You want to be great in God's eyes? Go low and serve. Serve. Don't look out for yourself, your own interests only. Look out for the, the concerns, the interests of others. Humble yourself. Serve. Go low. This is where greatness is found. And the culture says, no, greatness is found up here. Let me go back to Conor McGregor. And there's any number of people I could use, right? But sadly, a lot of professing Christians adopt this mindset about, yeah, 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 whatever, you know. And it's like, no, 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 no. We're missing the point. We're called to be absolutely the opposite of that. Look at Jesus. That's who we're called to be like. And so greatness is found in going low. Now, if a church gets that, We won't care about what the culture thinks about us, what our, quote, reputation is. We're not going to care about those things. We're going to be consumed with a passionate vision for the glory of God and just desiring to serve him and to know him and to love him and to walk with him and to care for one another and to be on mission with him, to run the race well, to finish well, no matter what that means, no matter what it costs, no matter what it looks like, because that's all that matters. Doesn't matter what people say about you. Doesn't matter what they say about me or the church. What matters is is, is who, who we look like. Who we look like. Do we look like the mob out there or do we look like Jesus? Who do we look like? Go low. Take the last seat. Don't seek the spotlight. Don't do anything out of selfish ambition or conceit. Greatness is found in being like Jesus. You know, Isaiah even described Jesus 725 years before his earthly ministry. It's it's really interesting. There's a lot we could look at in Isaiah 53. But he said this, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrow is acquainted with grief and as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not, you know, Jesus could have come to us looking in any way he chose, right? He could have come looking like Brad Pitt, looking like whoever you may think George Clooney, or whoever that guy is. Yeah, oh, that guy. Yeah, he's important. 
But what's amazing is even in the incarnation, his physical appearance was not something that people look at and say, oh yeah, that guy's special. And that's amazing to me. Not by accident. Again, Isaiah is so very clear. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that should make us desire him. In other words, it wasn't like we should, he came and looked like, oh yeah, we, he didn't even look like someone that you're supposed to be like, there's humility even in the incarnation, in his physical appearance. And then Jesus tells his disciples, again, if you're saying, well, this whole idea of going low, being great. No, listen to what Jesus says to his disciples in Matthew 20. You know this, 25 and following. Jesus called them to him and said, you know what the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. That's some crazy stuff when you look at it from a cultural perspective, isn't it? Because that's saying, I'm going to the back of the line. I don't need the applause of man. I don't need this out of the other. I just want to live with and for my Lord and Savior. Again, a, a people, a church that grasps this idea of greatness. God will use such a people, will use such a person in amazing ways. Now, you may never be, quote, known for that. Again, we may never be known, okay? Count Zinzendorf and is one of the all-time greatest names in human history, I should say. I love. A Moravian brother in the 1700s. And if you don't know about the Moravians, man, they were pretty radical people. <laughs> it was like praying to the earliest forms of the modern mission movement, we might say. Like, do crazy stuff sometimes, like just praying, getting on a boat wherever the Lord leads, and we're going to take the gospel there. Count Zinzendorf said this preach the gospel, die, be forgotten. How many of us would, you might say, well, that's, that's kind of, I don't know. This is what you see in the New Testament. This is what you see in the early, you don't see people running around. You see this, this consuming passion to preach the gospel, not to, to build their brand, not to get to the front of the line. You do know when you look at all, most of the apostles, that most of what we know of most of the apostles when they went off is oral history, just like, well, tradition says. A lot of them just went off, preached the gospel, and, were, and died. Are you comfortable with never being seen as important, or must you be seen as important? Must we? See again, culture, Christ, two very different things. And we got to choose what worldview who we're going to follow, what we're going to look like. You can't say I want to be both. Can't do that. You're straddling two worlds. Where again, to be like Jesus who was in the likeness of men, again, fully God, but also fully human. He knew hunger, fatigue, weakness, and he humbled himself. <laughs> he was obedient to the point of death on a cross, giving everything for our redemption. You think about God the Son on the cross. Through him all things were made. Creation, his own creation, spat on him, mocked him, rejected him, beat him, bloodied him, did not recognize him, crucified him. Did we deserve that? I mean, did we deserve that kind of love? A lot of us would be like, man, if that was me, I would have said, forget that. Boom. Forget this human experience, man. You're all done. I'm through with it. 
You might say, well, no, no, I think that I would be better than that. How many of you have ever poured out and tried to sacrificially love and to help someone who just continues to dig their heels in or whatever, and you reach a point where you're like, forget it. I'm not just, just forget it. And I'm not doing that anymore. <laughs> Aren't you glad that God did not do that with us? Do you see how radical this is? Why would we settle for less? Well, I think I know why. Because we're afraid that if we become this kind of a person, that, well, people might just take advantage of us, and they might, well, I don't know. And, 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 and I have, what about my needs? Can you trust the Lord to take care of your needs? Is Christ, if all you have is Christ, is he enough for you to have joy? Or do you have to have Jesus plus something else? You see, I mean, again, we're getting, this is intense stuff. But to be a people used by God, to be a people who know their God, we can no longer go in the direction of the culture. We have got to be the people the Lord has called us to be, and we can't do it in our own strength. We've got to ask the Lord to do this in us, and we've got to encourage each other to become this, pray for each other, point truth to each other. Again, remember who we're called to be, Okay? Because of the same God that we have, the same Father, the same Spirit, we have the same Lord, we can be a people of one mind, on one purpose, on the same page, moving in the right direction, in the same direction, together, in love, graciously and humbly serving one another, imitating our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave everything to redeem us and came to serve us. That is the life we're called to. Let's ask God to make that happen here. Let's ask God to do that in our lives, okay? This is our meditation before we partake of the supper. And because Christ has done all of this, verse 9 and following, therefore God has exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There is coming a day when every being is going to bow before the Lord Jesus Christ and say, you are king of kings, you are lord of lords. But the sad reality is, is because the road is broad that leads to destruction, that for most people it will be too late. You either bow the knee now before the king and experience life now, are you doing it's too late? He is a sovereign ruler over all of creation and all will acknowledge him as such. Jesus Christ is Lord.